We're in the Margaret Hunter shop here in Colonial Williamsburg, and we're going to be discussing lace with Sarah Woodyard, who is the journey woman here at the Margaret Hunter shop. So could you maybe tell us just about the beautiful things that you, you have here? Absolutely. Well, of course, as you can see, there's a lot of different applications mm -hmm. for lace. And it's a great way just to kind of make that item kind of pop out a little bit, almost like a statement piece of jewelry in a sense um, for say someone in your time period. Mm -hmm. And so on the counter, I've, I've brought out a variety of millinery items. Um, over here, we have a sarcenet cloak, a nice pale blue silk that's been trimmed with a, a Brussels lace. And what really makes it that Brussels lace is uh, because of the, the way that the flowers and the leaves have been filled in mm -hmm. um, with this, this kind of stitch, a little bit more of a, a bolder pattern in a sense, but would be quite expensive. And Brussels lace, as well as other Flemish laces, were really a favorite of Virginians here in the 18th century. We have a gauze apron that's also been edged in a Brussels lace. Now this apron is, is actually kind of interesting. Um, as you're buying your clothing and you're spending a lot of money on it, mm -hmm. you're really gonna be considering the, the care and the use of it in addition to the, uh, the statement that you're making with your clothing. But the, the top of the waist is very interesting. The top of this apron has been edged with what's called a Jacob's Ladder Lace. And you can really see here how the, the ribbon has been passed through um, those eyelets that were created in the Jacob's Ladder. The reason why we put this lace at the top of the apron is because in the servants' directories and laundry guides, they recommend instead of taking gauze and gathering it to a band, they recommend taking a gauze apron and stitching it to the top of Jacob's Ladder lace so that when it's laundered, the gauze can then be washed with soap and water and then pinned to a frame to dry so that the whole apron can be opened up versus say an Irish linen that you could starch and press with a hot iron. Mm -hmm. The gauze when pressed with a hot iron would become yellow and so you want to pin it without that. You want to pin it to a frame and then dry it without that heat. So not only is this Jacob's Ladder lace quite decorative, but it also is quite functional and gonna save that investment that you've made. Interesting. Very cool. So beyond the, the apron, um, this is probably one of my favorite pieces in the shop. <laughs> um, this is a, a poof, uh, a fashionable headdress for 1776. We made this based off of a, a print of a fashionable woman uh, in a, a London pleasure garden wearing this. And it's a gauze headdress trimmed with ribbons and then Italian flowers. But I think the lace is really what makes it up here at the top. And then of course we've got the back lappets of lace also trimmed with those Italian flowers. And this would go on the, the top of a very tall headdress, tall hair, and would really be well displayed on the top of the, the head. It looks a little bit odd out of context, but it, it looks beautiful on the, mm -hmm. on the head. Um, beyond that, we also have some delicate laces here. Um, this is a good example of how um, perhaps a more typical, more average Virginian might consume a little bit of lace because you are going to see pretty much everyone buying perhaps a little bit from time to time. Now this piece of edging lace has been applied to a, a muslin handkerchief which would be used around a lady's neckline. But the small edging lace is a great example of a cheaper lace that could be consumed by all levels of society, making it more accessible to a, a broader customer base here in the shop. Um, something else uh, underneath that is this handkerchief here, a pocket handkerchief, a good example of the fact that men are also consuming lace and would be buying this and keeping it potentially in their, their coat pockets. Here, over here we have some examples of how lace would be sold. Typically, you're going to see the laces on cards. Of course, we're going to be purchasing the lace from England, mm -hmm. but then England is buying it across Europe. Okay. And so they're gonna package it on a blue card. As you can see, it's very visually striking to have that, that lace next to the blue. And if that woman is coming in shopping, or if a, a man is coming in shopping, because men, of course, buy lace too, uh, they would be looking at the lace next to that blue to kind of give a sense of, of the design. Because next to white, it kind of disappears, right. but it really pops out with that blue, which I think is lovely. And then also just regular netting, um, which was often used for ruffles and caps uh, at this time period. Um, um, and beyond that, we also know that Margaret was selling what was called blonde lace, which tended to have a little bit more of a, a natural color to it, whereas Brussels lace would be made out of linen. The blonde lace tended to be made out of silk and would often have more of a natural yellow kind of tint to it. 
So I've brought out an elbow ruffle to kind of show a little bit of that, the difference that you might see with, say, blonde versus, say, a Brussels lace. Now, Sarah, where would this go on a gown? Where would this go on a gown? Mm -hmm. Now, this one is going to go um, in the elbows, just like my elbow ruffles mm -hmm. here. So Sweet. if you had a, a gown on, then, of course, we would take this. We would tack that into your sleeves, either pinning it or just stitching it in quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so you could wear it for a while, and when it came, went out of fashion, take it off mm -hmm. and buy a new one. Or apply it possibly to a new gown? Absolutely. Of course, people are reusing laces because it is such an investment. Mm -hmm. um, for example, I know that Martha Washington, um, she had a net handkerchief, and she writes uh, saying that she would like to have the net for a border for a cap. And that border, of course, would be the, the edging of the cap, the ruffle of the cap. Mm -hmm. And so she's reusing her, her net lace in that purpose. Okay, interesting. Um, just tell me a little bit about just the equivalent value of lace and just sort of its communicative power. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, well, like I said, it is definitely a statement piece and mm -hmm. it is an investment. Uh, and so if you see somebody with very fashionable, high quality lace, mm -hmm. you know, trimming the elbows of a gown mm -hmm. or putting in tuckers and tippets and caps, you're really going to show, it's going to show that that person has spent a lot of money on their clothing. So it certainly does have a level of, of status to communicate. However, what's a little bit tricky with that is some people will go into debt for fashion. And so while you might see somebody who is wearing expensive lace, mm -hmm. they might be someone who is of a higher level of society. They might be someone who decided that they wanted that lace, and so they purchased that lace. Mm -hmm. um, but it is still telling of that, uh, the desire to dress in a genteel fashion uh, in the 18th century. Well, Sarah, thank you so much. And it's just been great to, to see all the beautiful laces you have here in the Margaret Hunter shop. And thanks so much. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. Can we wrap up a piece of lace for you? Yes, please. Excellent. <laughs>